it's really just a recap of things that everyone else has already discussed but you know everything that we have discussed is person-centered support and it's about finding out what the individual needs to be supported to have that independence choice control and a good quality of life amongst other things you know it's about person-centered using your person-centered approaches um, and as we've already covered these might include is there an unmet medical need knowing how to communicate pain and discomfort uh, but also with that with the current situation um, you know emotional upset grief bereavement um, and just being aware that just like us people are struggling you know people are going to have their ups and downs and they might not even necessarily know I know I have my wobbles and I just know that yeah it's it's related to the situation but you might not necessarily even be able to pinpoint what specifically has upset you that day and so if we're struggling to understand and people with a disability are going to be struggling to understand as well and unfortunately can't communicate as well um using your, your consistent communication tools at their language level and maintaining that total communication environment um and just say as well if you've got you know if you're you know working for an organization and you've got you know multiple individuals you want to be having those person-centered approaches within the same home what we don't want to do is be having blanket approaches as kind of a best fit model so if one person's using BSL, you want to be using BSL with them. If another person's using Macapon, then you want to be using Macapon with them, um, for example. Engaging in meaningful activities and how can you expand on these at this time? Um, Ellie's given you lots of good examples and you should definitely check out the YouTube channel. So they've got some excellent videos on there. Also, how do they like to be supported? Um, you know, like with, uh, the support techniques um, that Ellie was discussing, but also, you know, what kind of tone do they like? What kind of interaction style do they like? Um, yes, there's a lot of demands right now. And yes, we've, you know, I can only imagine kind of the pressure organisations are under with all of the new policies and procedures that are coming out. But just bear in mind that rather than going through, you know, like a tick list of things that you need to do, how did, can a person be supported to do it better? Um, so like Kate was saying about giving choices of different hand soaps, um, playing favorite songs, for example, not only are they gonna feel better and happier, but you're also then gonna reduce the likelihood of behaviors of concern happening by taking that time to make it person-centered. And how are we maintaining relationships at this time? You know, who are important to the people that we're supporting? Um, you know, can they be having Zoom calls? Can they be doing group activities but at a social at a social distance and um, to keep those peer interactions um, and so if we're looking at person-centered support this is kind of the percentages we're hoping to get to if we're getting it right of what a service users day would look like so we're looking at 70 percent of their day being in the green on baseline so that's why it's so important for your proactive strategies and this is the list there of all the things that we've talked about and then we're hoping for only about a 20% of active strategy. So that's when people start to move away from baseline. And we need to be responding in the moment. So that's our de-escalation or distraction technique. And then obviously, you know, we'd hope to eliminate it altogether. But realistically, there might be about 10% of reactive strategies. And that's when people are going into that crisis mode. And the only thing that we can do is keep everybody safe. And if, if your days, if a person's day isn't looking like this and, you know, it, it's flipped and you're spending most of your time redirecting um, or dealing with crisis, then you want to be coming back to those proactive strategies and thinking, OK, what haven't we got right here? Um, and working with everyone that supports the individual to have a look at what can we do, what can we be doing differently to make sure that we get this right so that they're staying more on baseline. So just briefly on support plans, um, they get called lots of different things, could be behaviour support plans, could be PBS plans, whatever you want to call them. Let's just make sure they're up to date, things are changing at the moment, people are going to be presenting differently and that could be you know, positively or, or not so much. Um, so it's really good to have them as a working document, even if that just means you and colleagues writing over them and then reflecting on them every so often um, and updating them formally just so that you know you're keeping that getting that rich information of what's happening right now 
and, and as yeah in line with that um, support needs may change at the current situation people might need more or less of certain things so it's important to know what that looks like yeah and if you're making one for the first time you know if people are in their family homes and maybe usually they're somewhere else or you know they're at home full time when they would normally be at a day service and and you're experiencing behaviors of concern you might want to make your own support plan within the family home but it doesn't need to be complicated all you all you need to do is start by noting down what you already know about the person you support and discuss with all of their current support network to gather as much information as possible and you could use a template uh, or a table like what Kate showed or you um, again if you if you google or the transient behavior foundation or build there's lots of resources out there um, or just making, you know, in a, in a Word document. Um, and then, the, yeah, and just to come back to the escalation cycle, that the purpose of that is so we can be staying at that baseline and you'd be looking at documenting what baseline looks like, so what makes that person happy, what happens in an escalation, crisis, and then as we come down from there. So using the traffic flight system, you, you'd start with your proactive green strategies that keep the person on baseline, so happy, calm, etc., living their best lives. Again, not to not to go over everything um, that you've already heard this morning. That's going to include new skills that may help them, such as waiting, requesting people they're used to seeing, a new activity. So teaching those, you know, are there other things that you need to be updating in their communication tools? All the their, their, their normal communication needs that they have. Um, and you know you want to you want to be really descriptive here if, if, if necessary, um, because if someone's communicating with noises and gestures and body language, and everybody that supports them needs to know what those gestures look like and then also what they mean. Um, so for example, there's a young lady that I support um, which sings, and depending on the pitch that she's singing in, is either telling you that she's on baseline or she's escalating towards crisis. And so depending on the pitch of the singing that you hear is going to depend how you respond. So it's really important in that situation for the whole placement to understand the difference in that. Um, what are their favourite and meaningful activities? And as I just said, how do they like to be interacted with and supported? So that will be your green section. And then you'd move on to your amber section, which is recognizing those early warning signs that the behavior is changing. So just like I said about the change in, in pitch of singing, it could, it could be absolutely anything, but you're, you're already, you know, you know the people that you support. So it's just about getting this down and having a think. And it really helps to be talking to other people about it, of, you know, when they do this, what then usually happens or what's usually happened before that. And that's gonna start to give you a picture of what those first signs look like when someone is moving away from baseline. So it may be they have really good eye contact on baseline and when something's not gone their way, um, they move their eyes to their side and they're diverting eye contact or maybe they become non-responsive and the head goes down. Maybe they start playing with their saliva. You know, this isn't your full blown behaviors of concern incidents that you would be documenting, but these are those first signs that if you don't respond or, or or not respond, um, giving them that space, then things could escalate into that crisis. So these are those first kind of subtle changes. Maybe it's one small thing goes flying across the room and then if that person's given their space or their food's changed or whatever it is that you figured out is the reason for that behavior, everything's fine. And if you don't respond in that way, then maybe the whole plate goes flying across the room. Um, and as, I, yeah, as I've just covered, you know, what it looks like, what triggers, what triggers it? So then you're gonna know how to react and to be able to remove that trigger if possible. And what have been some successful methods to redirect and distract? So that's gonna be how you respond to the person. And then the red phase, um, this, is, this is our crisis stage and this is just about keeping everybody safe. Um, so again, it's gonna be person specific, but as, as we've covered some kind of key points, but again, this isn't a to-do list. This is going to be up to your own risk assessments and it's going to be up to your own policies and procedures. But in general, what we find is that less is more when it comes to language. So using simple or no language. Nobody can learn in a time of heightened stress. 
So giving someone loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of additional verbal information is either going to go nowhere or it's going to escalate the situation. Remain calm yourself and take deep breaths. If you tuned into our psychology webinar, Marissa talked a lot about co-regulation, which is simply put by you modeling, being calm and relaxed, that someone else can then, you know, fall into that kind of rhythm with you as well. Um, and, it, you know, you doing deep breathing can, and reducing your own stress levels, the person you're supporting may start to be able to do the same and, and to relax. And if you need to, then walk away. You know, if, you're, if it's getting heated, if it's getting agitated, if they're coming at you, if it's safe to do so, know when to walk away from the situation or to swap out with a number of member of staff or another family member if, if it's safe to do so. You also need to be aware of what kind of coming down from this looks like and when they're going into that recovery or kind of post um, incident depression phase, because if you engage too soon, then there's a risk of um, re-escalation. We have a look here, that is zigzaggy up part as your risk of re-escalation. So it may look like the behavior is reducing, um, but again, this is gonna be knowing the person of knowing when it's completely over before you're able to re-engage. And if it's an emergency or you feel that you cannot cope, um, then call 999. And that's that. Thank you.